topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio or its employees or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Welcome to Triversity Talk. It's Wednesday, 7 o'clock, and thank you for being with me here on Triversity Talk. You could be anywhere, but if you're watching this broadcast, you're here with me. Well, what an evening it's been, I have to tell you. As you all know, I sent out a lot of promotion for a game show called Rainbow Quest and its creator, Brian Kaufman. But with the weather being what it is these days, Brian is stranded in the Jersey Shore with no power. So to make a long story very short, I reached out to one of the most fabulous people I know in New York. And I said, I want you on the show tonight. First of all, he is a historian in his own right. He's an urban photojournalist. He is also the archivist of the Jackie Curtis photography, memoirs, and I can't think of a more exciting person to introduce you to tonight than the one, the only, Joey Preston. Hey, hey. You're there. Hi, Wendy. <laughs> isn't it great? It's magic when it works, Joe, isn't it? Oh, amazing, amazing. Uh, amazing. Thank Juan 100%. Right, and Juan, our incredible producer, we really were scrambling. Joe's computer wasn't acting up the way it should, and uh, we're doing his phone, my computer. You don't need to know all those gory details, but I got to tell you, people have no idea what goes into streaming. And it's streaming, as you all know, is what's happening the way of the future, the way of the present, and sometimes it's got its challenges. But right. determination will prevail. Absolutely. Joe, thank you for um, being here with us tonight. And I, you are, to me, the quintessential New Yorker. And <laughs> you're, you are. I mean, you, you stories of your family. You know, so many of us came here. Well, I came from the Bronx. It doesn't count. The Bronx migration. <laughs> <laughs> So many people in New York that have become part of his history came here 40 years ago from the Midwest or the South. You know, everybody comes here because, well, like Madonna said, it, it happens in New York. We always right. say it can happen here. It can happen anywhere. You right. came from a New York legacy family. Could we start just talking a little bit about your family? Well, uh, my great grandmother came here in 1904. Wow. And she landed in Manhattan, um, basically in a couple of different neighborhoods on the Lower East Side, predominantly. Which, yeah, which is where all the immigrants came when they came. Absolutely. And wow. there was also an Italian section uh, up in Harlem um, in the teens, 100 teens. So she lived on 118th Street for a while. Uh, but then my grandmother brought her back down to the East Village, which was still really part of the Lower East Side at that point, because it's below 14th Street. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what they say, anyone in the East Village, if they go above 14th Street, they get a nosebleed. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that's our, our standard line. Yes. So your family came here really the um, early 1900s and, you know, there they were in the East Village. Now your uh, grandmother, her, her first business, it was a bar. Well, her first business was actually a luncheonette counter. Ah. And she opened that up just west of 2nd Avenue on 12th Street, on East 12th Street. Wow. Um, and then her, one of her cousins had the bar across the street. 
And he said to her, Annie, do you want to buy the bar? So my mother was with my grandmother at that time, and they stood in front of it. And my grandmother said to my mother, she said, should I buy it? And my mother said, of course, absolutely. Um, and that started the role. Um, you know, um, my the grandmother's recipe. name was uh, Slugger Ann before that. Lug um, Slugger Ann. Was her, <laughs> oh, her name was Ann, but she was Slugger Ann. What, what did she do to get that name? Well, she was a taxi dancer. And a taxi dancer uh, lines up in a club. And men buy tickets uh, to dance uh, with the uh, women of their choice. I so um, sometimes the men got out of hand and um, they put their hands where they shouldn't. Oh, uh, like and wham, you know, my oh. grandmother was all but about five foot two. Uh, but they all wore those chunky heels in the 1940s and 50s. Well, so. Um, I, cause I want to add that the taxi dancer thing is completely fascinating because I have to tell you, most people don't even know about it, but I'm thinking while we're talking, you remember that song, 10 cents a dance? Yes, of course. On the taxi dancers. Right. Right. Oh, wow. Well, our, our, uh, generation, I would say would understand it more of Tina Turner's song, private dancer. I'm your private dancer, dancer for money. money do right. what you want me to do. You see? Uh, so oh that's. My gosh. I never thought of it that way. I always took that song, right? Because I'm of this time as a lap dancer. But it, yes. it's not. It's, well, uh, you know, what went on behind the scenes is, right. you know, <laughs> never spoken about really. Course, but, right. uh, you know, what Tina Turner sings about is. I keep my mind on the money and my eyes on the wall, you see. Wow, right. So there were so many men coming in, and that's where she actually met my father. Um, you know, my mother, because my mother and my aunt, uh, who happens to be Jackie Curtis's mother, also worked as tansy, taxi dancers. Well, the whole, the whole family, I want the whole scenario, the whole family was um, part of this bar. And I think it... it I, you've told me this story so many times, but I'm really listening tonight and I'm thinking about what dynamic females you come from. Seriously, these were like the uh, business women, independent, self employed yes. of the time. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, Sicilian women are very tough and right. uh, they're usually the head of the household. Right. Um, <laughs> so she was, she was business minded. And, um, you know, she had to support the family. Um, um, you know, there was no two ways about it. And the family helped with the business also. Of course, because um, you're Italian and everybody, you're Italian. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I would uh, be a waiter at the tables. My mother would be behind the bar. My aunt would be behind the bar. Curtis would be behind the bar serving drinks also. I call him Curtis. Everybody else knows him as Jackie. But in the family, we call him Curtis. And, um, and for those of you listening, because this show is broadcast nationwide, Jackie Curtis is, of course, from the whole Warhol family and a, a very right. famous personality. Uh, and Joe will be talking more about that later. And we have incredible pictures to show. OK, so um, the whole family was at this bar. Yes, absolutely. We all contributed what we could. Right. I basically grew up in the bar because wow. I went to grade school across the street from the bar. Wow. And I would go there uh, before my mother came home uh, and do my homework. So, uh, you know, I saw all the characters coming in and out. And okay. as I got a little older, they were, um, how do you say, um, more and more characters in and out. You know, um, I, you know, I have a question for you um, about New York at that time. And I guess as you started to uh, get a little older, were you aware of who was gay and who wasn't that would come in the bar? What was it like then? Well, in the 60s, um, she basically had a very straight clientele 
and I would say a neighborhood clientele. Okay. Uh, it was not gay oriented whatsoever. Um, the East Village uh, itself in the 60s and 70s was not gay oriented. It's it was very, very it's a family. Wow. <laughs> very family oriented. Wow. And, it, you know, you knew people from block to block. You know, you were a clique on your own block. Of course. Um, so, um, you know, it was, um, how can I say, very cliquish. Uh, right. You know, we stayed on our own block. We hung out with our own neighbors. Everybody knew each other's business. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Right. Do you, do you think some of that had to do, everybody was Italian in the neighborhood then, right? Well, no. No, oh. I, not at all. Not at all. There was a heavy uh, Puerto Rican um, uh, community in the neighborhood, but also mixed with the Italians from the old world still, from wow. the first half of the 20th century. Wow. Um, you only spoke there, Italian, I'm sure. Who? They only spoke Italian. Some of them did. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. My mother spoke Italian. My grandmother spoke Italian, but they never taught me. So I didn't know Italian at all. Uh, but we also had Slavic in the neighborhood. We had, um, you know, um, uh, a big concentration of Slavic Eastern Europeans as well. You see? And that's so, why they called New York. New York was a big melting pot at the time. And, you know, from my knowledge of it, so many different nationalities all lived in what we call the tenement buildings. Now we call them low rises, but right. remember my right. grandfather, <laughs> right. My grandfather calling my mother, even my mother referring to the area, you know, the the tenements in that area. So Yeah, um, and a lot a lot of them had the bathrooms in the hallway. Bathroom and, um, and a lot of them were cold water flats, which were less expensive also at the time. Um, you know, I, I knew a family that uh, was kicked out of where Stuyvesant Town is now uh, when they were building it in the 1940s. And they went to 172nd Avenue and looked at an apartment, but it was $33 uh, a month and they couldn't afford it. So they came down a couple of blocks toward Fourth Avenue uh, and became our neighbors where the rent was $18. $18 uh, a month, don't we wish? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, those were the times. But uh, there were a lot of Ukrainians, a lot of Jewish people, um, a lot of Polish as well. Yeah, um, we still have evidence um of the restaurants there. I know we have a, a wonderful between 12th and 13th is an, still a wonderful Polish restaurant there. Yeah. It's called little Poland. Little Polish. Yeah. Yeah. On second Avenue. Oh boy. Uh, can they make the stuffed cabbage there? I got boy. it. Oh, <laughs> like, you have, like you're melting your mouth. Your lips <laughs> then so, we have the uh, on nine street also, you know? Yeah. Vasilka is of course really famous. Everyone knows it. So, um, Joe, you know, Jackie was your cousin, right? And you're both working in the bar. So Jackie at that time was how old? Um, well, Curtis was 12 years older than me. Right. So, okay, so, we're already, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, young. I was the, you know, I came in at the end, the very, very end. Um, right. But we were 12 years apart, but we were on the same level. Right. Uh, you know, we can speak to one another and have civil conversations and civil intelligent conversations. conversations, you know. Um, one so day. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I was going to ask you, like, what Curtis was was like then, because Curtis became, of course, so unbelievably bigger than life, flamboyant, right? Amazing performer. What was Curtis like at 21 or 22 working in the bar with you? Well, you know, he was like Melissa Tentries, for instance. Um, he had multiple personalities ah. for what he was doing and where he was at the time. Um, when he was doing theater and on stage or living in drag for the five years that he lived in drag from 70 to 75, 69 to 75 or so, um, he, um, 
you know, that was a persona, a theatrical persona. But when you sp when you met him otherwise, and he was not in drag, he was a very low key intellectual. And you can speak to him on a very normal basis and wouldn't know that was Jackie Curtis sitting across the table from you. Uh, um, that uh, what you're telling us, what you're sharing is really quite interesting, even for me. And you and I have had many conversations about Jackie Curtis and, and the work uh, that mm -hmm. was created. But the low key persona, that is a true chameleon, by the way, what what you're presenting right now, someone that can transform because a lot of the people, uh, even that we know now that, that do drag, they're, they're a different person when they're out of drag, but uh, most of them that I know, I wouldn't certainly wouldn't call them low key, you know, not, nothing about right. them. They have that big personality, which allows them to do drag. Jackie though, I mean. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. you know, there was also another, Jackie, I, I would say, um, you know, maybe alcoholic Jackie at one point. Part of the personality. Another personality or drug Jackie. Right. Uh, it's dependent on the mood of the day, uh, on what he was doing that particular time, whether he was narrow, thin uh, in his body, or he gained a lot of weight. He, um, I, I, don't, I don't even know that Jackie. The Jackie that yeah. I've seen is... You are the body of a model. Yes, he actually does have the body of a model. Um, you know, when he was doing drag um, and not eating. Um, but the, you know, the the biggest misconception about uh, I I still call him Curtis. I'm sorry. Uh, the biggest misconception about Curtis uh, was the fact that um, you know he always had a place to live, and he always had food to eat. So this bohemian lifestyle of being in the theater and actually pretending that, you know, his my my mother kicked him out of the house or my grandmother kicked him out of the house, you know, that was basically part of the theatrical Jackie. The struggling artist persona. Right. Correct. Wow. Um, but he also he always had food. He had money, a uh, little money to spend here and there. Uh, but uh, he was basically, you know, not about money. He was about his craft. Right. He was about his art, and he was about theater. Um, he was a brilliant playwright. He wrote about a dozen plays, uh, mostly put on at La Mama or Bastiano's, uh, and he gave um, um, Robert De Niro his first part. Are in, you in, wow. Yeah, yeah. Robert De Niro used to have uh, live in the neighborhood and his uh, family had a, a, a printing store, but he was looking to get into, um, into acting and theater. And he heard about Glamour, Glory and Gold coming about. And um, the whole story is he ran over to Curtis and Holly and Candy were all there and he was begging to be in the show. And they said, are you sure you could do all 10 parts? And he said, absolutely. He did them so well, but that was his first acting job, acting on stage. And he did, um, wow, all 10 parts, which I, I know, of course, the script from Glamour, Glory, and Gold, having participated in that reading with you, um, the language was incredibly complicated. Honest yes. to God, I had to learn any of those parts, I would need months, months <laughs> to do it. Right. And I'm talking one part. De Niro was able to learn 10 parts. That's amazing. Yes. The 10 parts were basically the husbands of Nola Noonan, who was the up and coming star. Right. And she meets a bunch of clowns along the way. So he would run backstage, change his clothes real fast and run back out and be somebody else you see, and have like a two or three minute scene, run back out and come back on okay. stage and be somebody else, you see. So, um, so yeah, that, he got his first uh, start with, uh, with Jackie's show. I'm, I'm glad we're having this conversation about Jackie Curtis, because what you're unveiling is things that many people don't know. 
And um, I, if I wonder if I were to interview De Niro and said, how did you get your start? I wonder if he would come clean and tell me that. I don't know. I don't know. Cause I've looked up so many things on the internet yeah. and it doesn't exist, but there is a book on De Niro that somebody wrote and um, an autobiography, uh, a biography um, that explains it in a whole page and a half. So, um, so yeah, you know, uh, Curtis was, knew everybody in theater uh, and everybody knew him. Um, you know, it was the downtown underground of New York. Yes. Uh, David Bowie, uh, Bette Midler, uh, oh, yeah. everybody. Bette Midler actually had him fired from one of his early shows. Get out! Yes. Um, it was a Tom Iron production called Miss Nefertiti um, Regrets. <laughs> and uh, she was in the show and somehow she had Curtis fired and he was very young. He was like 16 years old. 16 um, in the show. Wow. He, yeah, he was kind of hurt from that, but he never spoke bad about her uh, ever. Curtis never spoke bad about anybody ever. So. But he was already at 16, would you say, a seasoned actor? I mean... He was he was beyond brilliant. Beyond that was brilliant. the whole point. Right. He he was alone within himself. He had the family, but outside of my mother, quite frankly, I was too young to understand what he was going through. Uh, but outside of my mother, you know, because she was in show business, understood him. Um, you know, he didn't have too many people in the family to to relate to. You see. Um, his, uh, Curtis's mother was very, um, how can I say, uh, provincial okay. in her personality. So, um, yeah, they didn't get along at all. Uh, they had a, they had a big fight. You had this incredible kid with more layers than you could peel off of an onion and yes. she didn't know what to do with them. I mean, no, it's no, she now, uh, she and my grandmother tried to get Curtis into the mainstream media, and yeah. it wasn't Curtis's yeah. desire whatsoever. He did it for a few years, um, uh, but it, it really didn't work for him. And then he met Candy and Holly, Candy and Darling it. and Holly Woodlawn, um, and they told him to dress in drag. And when he dressed in drag, that's when he met Warhol. You see, right okay. in the village, in the West Village. Wow, that's that's the uh, the how the how to of how it all happened. So he started at that point, I guess, working with Warhol. Um, Curtis met uh, Warhol on Greenwich Avenue, and Warhol said to him, "What's in your shopping bag?" And he says, oh, the posters for my new play, you have to come see it, Vain Victory, right? So he gave him a, a flyer and Warhol came to see it. And uh, that's basically what started everything. So, um, but uh, even before Vain Victory, um, Curtis wrote Glamour, Glory and Gold. Um, and that was done in 67 and 68 with De Niro, you okay. see. So uh, Curtis was was very very well known and very popular. Right, and he uh, didn't need Warhol. He absolutely didn't need Warhol. Warhol needed Jackie Curtis, actually. Yes, Warhol uh, latched on to the drag queen scene with Candy Darling and Hollywood Lawn, and unusual people who were in the circuit of Union Square when he came down. And and rented his uh, his studio there, his factory there, you see. So they would all hang out, just as we hang out at Pangea all the time. Right. Um, you know, they come and go, um, and got involved in Warhol's films, and Warhol would pay them very very little money, but there was also drugs flying around all over the place. So, you know, it was a it was a click. It was uh, it was a group. Right, you but know. it was also a very creative click at, at the time. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, some brilliant people came out of the factory. Uh, you know, Lou Reed 
for instance. Um, well, he, Lou Reed wrote uh, Take a Walk on the Wild Side. There was a, a stanza about Jackie in there, right? There's a stanza about Jackie, uh, Candy, and Holly, and others. Sugar Plum Fairy. I, I'm trying to, I'm picking my brain. I remember flew into Miami FLA, hitchhiked his way across the USA. That was for Holly. That was Holly, right? Okay. Uh, Curtis's was, Kurt, uh, Jackie is just speeding away. Jackie's Thought right. she was James Dean James for a Curtis. day. <laughs> right. It's right. that verse. Wow. You know? Um, and, uh, you know, Jackie emulated James Dean so much, uh, that he went out to Hollywood to, uh, audition for the part, uh, to do the James Dean story. How incredible that would have been. Yes. And, um, he was also very good friends with David Law, uh, and Lenny Prusak, who now own the, um, the, the James Dean Museum and Gallery in, uh, Fairmount, Indiana. So, oh, Baltimore. yeah, those two gentlemen in Fairmount, Indiana. Wow. wow. Right. Right. Wow. So, so, Joe, you have some pictures to show us. Yes. Let me see if I can get them right. Just let me know if you can see them. Okay. Wendy's putting her glasses on for this. Okay. You're a little curled in the corner. Just get it really flat. <laughs> get it, yeah, right up to your... Um, yeah. Okay. A little bit higher. Beautiful. Gorgeous. Just hold that still. That's beautiful. Andy Warhol's women. What's happening in this picture, Joe? Um, what Curtis is doing is um, laying on the couch and it's a scene from women in revolt. Oh my God. That's so <laughs> wow. Right. And um, it, in some posters, it, it says women in revolt and in others, it just says women. And Candy's on the poster. Putting on my glasses to see Candy on the poster. <laughs> oh, sorry. That's okay. I'm, I'm good. Okay. That's really amazing. So, um, yeah. So, uh, Women in Revolt was, was really um, uh, one of Warhol's uh, more popular films. So, um, you know. And, and there was a lot of ad-libbing. Um, uh, because there wasn't a script. Uh, right. They just said, you know, um, you know, Jackie knows what to say. He, he'll think of something, you know. And, oh, yeah, uh, of course. Brilliant like that. Of course, he would think of something on the spot. Absolutely. Yes. Here's another shot from Women in Revolt. Oh, that's great. Yeah, just hold it exactly the way you got it. Beautiful. So, um how beautiful Jackie Curtis is. My God. Who is in the poster with Jackie Curtis? Uh, one of the other actors. I, I really couldn't tell you because the only billing is uh, with Jackie, uh, with Jackie, uh, okay, Candy yeah. and Holly. Um, right. Now, a few years ago, uh, Scott Whitman. Um, I think we all know who Scott Whitman is. He's uh, uh, a brilliant producer and composer yes. uh, on Broadway. And he used to um, uh, do shows at La Mama and was um, uh, connected with La Mama as being on the board of directors also. Uh, but he did a show about Jackie called Jukebox Jackie. Oh. And, um, and that was about 10 years ago. And let's see if I can hold that up. Oh, the picture is amazing. That's great. Right. I mean, look at, look at the attitude and the body language. Um, and of course, I love this. Justin Vivian Bond was in it. I'm reading the who's an incredible, incredible performer. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, I love Bridget Everett, Jackie who we Scott. all know. Bridget Everett. Yeah. Um, you know, she went it. on to have her own television show. On now. Um, yeah, on and Hulu. she's constantly at Joe's Pub. Uh, yeah. She puts on shows at Joe's Pub. Phenomenal cast. It was a beautiful production. Um, and I'm very, very proud of it. So, uh, yeah. So. I, I, um, I would imagine, Joe, you know, doing what you're doing, you have to be very protective of how Jackie's work is used, you know? So when somebody produces something like that and you tell us that you, you really, really thought it was great, it was really great. 
Well, I'm the executor of of Curtis's literary estate. Yes. Okay. So when people want to use whatever he wrote in his plays or poetry, they have to come through me. Right. Um, uh, but, you know, things like uh, Women in Revolt, you know, I have nothing to do with. Right. You know, the, um, but I, the literary estate, I am in charge of. You're the uh, keeper of the keys of the literary estate. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, well. It, you, you opened the can of worms with that one. Because... I did. I just need you to fix your speaker on your phone for a second. Sorry? It, your phone speaker. Yeah. It went off for a minute. Oh, it's, okay. It, it's, it, yeah. What you did by saying that was opening up a, a can of worms. That's how I, this all happened. Had, um, you know, Curtis's stuff was all in the apartment when he died. Okay. And, um, you know, I was basically, but not really basically, I was the only one who had to put everything into storage. Um, what, I but, can't imagine, that's so daunting. While we're talking, just take your hand off the phone microphone. It's covering the microphone on the phone. Okay, how's that? Uh, so we still are getting uh, a different sound. Do you oh. have your hand off of the microphone on the phone? How's that? Still... Hey, no. We can hear it. We'll just have to work with it. So um, you were the person that was there when Curtis passed. Um, yes. Um, we had gotten the uh, message um, quite rudely. Um, a, a cop came up to our house and um, banged on the door and said, do you know uh, a Jackie Curtis? And we said, yes. He said, oh, can I use your phone? And we said, I said, yes, of course, come in. So he picked up the phone and he said, hello? Oh, he's dead? Thank you. Bye. Oh, my God. Joe, I can't. Um, you, ha you had to be in shock. My mother almost fainted. Uh, my mother was there. She wasn't well at the time. She was going through cancer. And I was standing there, and I was ballistic. I was furious. Um, not only uh, because of what happened, but the way the message was delivered to us. Oh, because cool. he hung up the phone, looked at me, and smiled, and said, bye. Did he even connect who you and your mother were? Say it again. Oh, good. Your microphone's working now. Whatever you did, we're back where we need to be. Did okay. Policemen connect who you and your mother were? Um, he really didn't get into that whatsoever. He, he just asked if we neighbor. knew them. Oh, that's so cold. This is such a cold story. It really is. It really is because um, uh, Curtis died of an overdose. So cops were not really sympathetic to people. No. Yeah, if you were shooting had... the drugs, they didn't care about you. Yeah. And there were other people, um, you know, uh, there before me and all of this kind of thing who found out about it before us. And, um, you know, uh, this is what happened. But uh, Curtis's father, uh, you know, put me in charge of everything. And I was like, OK, because I was the only one here. Right. So I just packed everything up and. Brought it over to Manhattan Mini Storage and went I through it for the next it. six months. <laughs> you know. So you uh, have every piece of poetry, every play, every amazing. Everything that was in the apartment, except for the clothes. Uh, the clothes, I only have a few pieces left. Um, uh, they were quite, they were soiled. Um, you know, uh, Curtis used to take baths in the dresses. Uh, you, you know, he used to spray the wigs with Raid. Oh, my God. And you know why? Him and Is Holly it? were walking down 2nd Avenue one day, and Holly turns to Curtis and says, Curtis, what's that smell? He says, it's Raid. He says, well, why is it Raid? He says, I spray my wigs with Raid. And Holly said, Why? He says, because there's a lot of roaches in New York. It kills two birds with one stone. God! <laughs> <laughs> we can be something right here, right? 
What? Does drag should think about this. This is a little household tip from Joe Preston. Spray your boots <laughs> with Raid. And they've improved the scent, so there may be something to it. <laughs> Maybe there's lemon scent now. I have no idea, but, you know, everybody used two cans of Aquanet back right. then. Right, exa exactly. You know. Um, Oh my gosh. Now you had the opportunity, didn't the LGBTQ center on 13th street do um, a retrospective on Jackie Curtis? Um, about six years ago. See, I had kept um, all of uh, Curtis's memoirs, I would say, and memorabilia in storage and in my apartment for the last 30 years. But then I moved and I couldn't take everything with me. And I thought it was time to really find a, a place that I trusted. Of course. Um, and that was really local. And it was just so wonderful because they had just renovated the space, the archival space at the LGBT Center. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful. On West 13th Street, right? So um, I donated everything to the center that I had and it, you know, you have to make an appointment to go and you can see it. And, oh, but you know, that's, it, great. that's great. What, uh, what an honor to Jackie Curtis's legacy, you know, really Joe, I mean, a lot of people don't get the opportunity to do that. When someone like that passes, if they don't have someone like you to protect really who they were. Yeah. Um, you know, his father was from down South. Um, and he says, you know, Joey, I'm putting it into your hands, you know. So I went to a lawyer. I got everything done. And, um, you know, uh, the expenses came out of my pocket as well, oh, yeah. um, you know. But, um, you know, uh, we did what I did what I had to do because my mother was very sick. Right. Uh, and my brother was not involved with us at all. Oh, wow. So um, it was like. Okay, well, you know, everybody scattered, you know. Um, you know, they didn't want to get involved for whatever reason. Um, what, what an, it's an incredible, um, first of all, you know, hearing these details, uh, the the policeman who was completely not horrible um, about you and your mother, and then being told by Jackie's biological father here, you know, you're, you can have it, you can deal with it. You had a lot thrust on your shoulders at that time. It was all so immediate. I, I couldn't begin oh, to tell you. Right. Um, you know, I, uh, I call it doing Curtis's last production. Um, really? You know, because the next morning um, I was ordering the funeral uh, with money that I didn't have, that nobody had yet. And uh, I had to go also to the morgue to identify him. Oh, my God. And, uh, you know, if you've ever been there, I don't know what they do now. But, um, you know, they can I can I say wh what they did? Oh, can my I God. You? you can say whatever you want on this show. This is incredible what you're sharing. Well, they bring you into a room. And they lifted a curtain. And I said, my goodness, how many curtains have been lifted through Curtis's lifetime, you know, during his productions? Oh, so God, they what lifted a, a What a metaphor. I'm holding on to the railing and they're lifting the curtain. And as they're lifting the curtain, an angular slab with Curtis's body was being pushed up on an angle and pressed up against the other side of the glass. But because of the way Curtis died with the drugs in his system, uh, he was over bloated. Of course. And I had to say, yes, that's Curtis. And the curtain came down and the slab went down flat again. Um, but I'll tell you, ordering a funeral, identifying the body, uh, all was a big whirlwind. Joe, how old were you? How old were you when this was going on? 20, 26. That is like, whoa. An awful, yeah. lot, of, a, a, an awful lot of real life stuff 
really thrown at you within 24 hours. Oh, absolutely. And then, you know, I had to deal with my mother's emotions. Right. Your mother's emotions. And you said your mother wasn't well at the time. So you had that going on. Yeah, she wasn't well. Um, And the issue was, is that my mother was more of a mother to him than his own mother. Um, So I'm going to move away for a second because I have to plug in the phone as we're talking. (laughs) Oh, please. This is real life live stream. That's right. We plug in here. We do whatever we have to do to make the show go on. (laughs) Yeah. I'm in the living room, but I'm going to turn. um, You know, I've got the pictures up there. Now, I didn't bring them with me when I just ran downstairs. Do you want to go get the pictures? Yeah, let me get the pictures. Okay. Sing a song in the meantime. It's fine, Joe. You you go get the pictures. For those of you who are tuning in to this podcast, we're having an amazing conversation. Joe Preston is my guest tonight, and he is in charge of the literary portion of the estate of Jackie Curtis. For people that are saying, hmm, Jackie Curtis sounds familiar. You will all remember Jackie Curtis as part of the Warhol family. There was Candy Darling, Hollywood Lawn, and Jackie Curtis. And of course, as part of the whole Warhol era. And Joe, you're back with us. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> I had to run up to the penthouse part of the, the apartment. Guys. In the archives. <laughs> <laughs> so you have some more pictures, right? Because we're on the last five minutes. Oh, we are. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm okay. Real quick. Um, oh, beautiful. Look at Jackie. Beautiful. Okay. I'm going to hold up another one. The last one that you just held up, Jackie, that was from what? Uh, that was a that was a studio shot um, of Beautiful. that Curtis and I together. Got it. Okay, back let me in nineteen eighty with the blonde hair. Yes, yes. Beautiful. And this is when he was doing um, uh, the life of Francis Farmer. Get out! What an incredible talent. Yes, uh, the Francis Farmer was not the Francis Farmer story was called "I Died Yesterday." Um, here's another image. Yeah, this Curtis. is one I'm very familiar with. Curtis, a pinup. It's very pinup, this image. Very pinup, yes. Um, you know, that's amazing, Joe. Um, Jackie Curtis channeled each character that he that he was. And this is right. like, we, I know we're using the word drag a lot, but this is well beyond drag. This is yes. true performance art. Yes. And I also want to just highlight to visit JackieCurtis.com. There's an entire website. And also try and rent or view yes. Superstar in a House Dress, The yes. Life and Legend of Jackie Curtis, yeah. uh, of which um, Craig Heiberger was the producer. I was the associate producer. Um, and let me see if I can just get a real quick image of the... Yeah, whatever whatever you need to do. Oh, there it is. There's a poster. Superstar in a house dress. The life and legend of Jackie Curtis. A pioneer in 1960s. 60s and 70s. Um, and into the 80s. Um, yeah. y- you know. Uh, but he became distant from Warhol in about, at about 1975 or so. Okay. Right. Um, so, um, yeah, um, you know, and this, this one. Oh, be- oh, that's the artist. What's her name? Uh, yes. that's done by Alice Neal. Uh, yeah. Um, that right. painting went for $1.7 million back in 2009. Oh my gosh. At Sotheby's. And it's the highest price paid for a drag queen in history. (laughs) Really? Yes. And when Alice Neal's work tours all over the world, it just recently toured at the Metropolitan Museum and everybody was ogling over this painting. 
Right. Um, they just loved it. Um, and actually, Alice did two of Curtis. One is a boy, one is a girl. I so. think I remember, remember that uh, as well. Wow, what an incredible story. Joe, as we start to wrap everything up, what is next for you? Uh, I wrote a book during the pandemic. Um, <laughs> you know, on my uh, life with uh, Curtis. Um, and um, it's a work in progress. I did feel I finished it, but it's a work in progress and things still keep coming to mind. So when when I'm ready to publish it, I will do so and let you know. Oh, absolutely. And when it, actually when it's published, I'll have you back on this show. And of course, on If These Walls Could Talk at, at Pangea, you're part Fabulous. of that whole legacy. And we got to talk about the book there. Thank you so much for tonight. Uh, Pleasure. I love what you're doing. And I am really blessed to have you in my life as well. And the feeling's mutual. I'm, uh -huh. I'm blessed to have you, Alan, and Kyle in my life as well. Thank, Thank you, you so much. You take care of yourself. Good night, everybody. Stay Good night. safe. Be Bye. Well. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>